Hello everyone and welcome to week three of English 213. This week um, I'd like you to start off by watching this lecture. Hopefully that's what you're doing. Um, second, I'd like you to read the selections from um, Chaucer. Um, there's the introduction on um, Geoffrey Chaucer 238 to 43, selections from the Canterbury Tales including the general prologue, the Miller's prologue in tale and the Wife of Bath's prologue in tale, which are found on pages 243 and 310, and the close of the Canterbury Tales, which is on page 340. I'd like you to participate, participate in this week's conversation about the Canterbury Tales. And then there's, please take the two quizzes on the Canterbury Tales as well. So welcome to the Middle Ages. We're in a different time period than we, are, than we were in last week. Well, last week, we, reading Beowulf, we saw um, an ancient um, society um, from um, tinged through the lens of um, a Christian lens. Um, now we see an actual, um, uh, Christ, uh, you know, the actual society in which um, the, uh, you know, in ancient Eng England in the Middle Ages, um, we're looking at um, what it was like to be a Christian during this time. Um, and also looking at um, what life was like um, for common folk during this time period. So this week we're reading Chaucer's famous um, Canterbury Tales. It was um, first published in 1386, um, and Chaucer lived from 1343 to, the 14, to 1400. Um, this text is written in Middle English, so if you do read it straight, as it appears in the text, um, you may have, it'll, it'll be slow reading. You can do it. It's, you know, and I highly encourage you reading at least part of it this way. But if you'd like to access a modernized version of Canterbury Tales, please follow this link. This is a legitimate um, uh, translation into modern English. Um, and I will be referring to it um, when I'm referring to sections. Um, so we can have a common understanding of what's happening. Um, the Canterbury Tales as a whole is a set of 22 complete tales. Um, there's two incomplete tales as well, and it's some. It's called a framing tale. So it's it's um, the the tales are. Um, there's a beginning. The opening section um, is uh, the general prologue, and that sets up um, what's happening. Um, the story is set at the Tabard Inn. Um, there's a group of pilgrims that are going off to Canterbury, um, and it was very common during this this um, time period for people to go off on pilgrimages. In fact, um, as our um, textbook tells us, if you read the, the intro about Chaucer, you'll, you'll know that where Chaucer lived when he was writing this um, was in view of one of the many pilgrimages that was set up. And a pilgrimage is just going on a, a religious um, journey, so going somewhere in order um, for the purpose of religion. Um, this uh, the general pro prologue uh, sets up all these pilgrims um, meeting in this one tabard inn, and it sets up um, the you know what what's going to happen in, during the course of these tales, um, and then um, it gives kind of like a little introduction to each of the of the the each of the participants, each of the people who are who are going to tell their tale. Then each then afterwards you see a prologue and then a tale for each person. Uh, we're going to be looking in depth at this week um, at uh, the, the Wife of Bath's um, tale, uh, but you'll also be reading the Miller's prologue and tale. So in order to really understand um, where the Canterbury Tales is coming from, we need to look quickly, we need to look, you know, at the, at the prologue and understand where it's coming from. So the general prologue, the first 18 lines are are really um, setting up the idea of spiritual rebirth. So I'm going to read this to you. This is a modern English version. Um, when April's gentle rains have pierced the drought of March, right to the root, and bathed each sprout through every vein and liquid of such power, it brings forth the engendering of the flower. When Zephyrus, too, with his sweet breath, has blown through every field and forest, urging on the tender shoots, and there's a youthful sun, his second half course through the ram now run, and little birds are making melody, and sleep all night, eyes open as can be. So nature pricks them in each little heart. On pilgrimage, then folks desire to start. The palmers long to travel foreign strands, to distant shrines renowned in sundry lands. 
and specially from every shire's end in England folks to Canterbury went to seek the bliss the blissful martyr in their will the one who gave such help when they were ill so the setup of this is using a natural metaphor so the idea of the rebirth of spring and making and parallel making that parallel to the um, the, pe the pilgrimages that people will go on to get a spiritual rebirth so not only is nature rebuilding itself um, bringing back life where before there were none so the people of Can the people will go to Canterbury as a way to really set forth their spiritual rebirth on what they're um, you know on their in the courses of their lives this is a really great section to really set up the idea of um, where people were coming from. You know, pilgrimages were really popular during this time period in England, um, and uh, Chaucer is both paying attention to that and documenting that, but he's also um, analyzing it and trying to understand it. And um, when you look at each of these, you know, these these characters that you're going to meet in each of these tales, um, know that this form, the, the framing tale. Um, it used to, you know, normally it would have this moral, you know, uh, it, would, it would end with a moral lesson, kind of like, um, you know, like fairy tales. Think of fairy tales. So you would read the tale, and then you would be told, and that's what happens when you do this, right? But these are not set up this way. These are set up to show us um, individual ideas, individual people, and what they mean. And that's why it's such a special piece of literature. Even though it was written so long ago, there's things we can find in, to, in it that, that relate to things we think about today. So on that note, I'd like you to um, look closely this week about um, when, when you read um, Wife of Bath's um, uh, tale and prologue, I want you to really pay attention to it because um, we're going to be talking about it in our discussion forum. So the characters in the prologue are a wife and her five husbands. She had three old husbands and then two young husbands. The sections I really want you to pay attention are lines one through 168, where the wife, um, the wife gives her defense of multiple marriages in which she deploys the learned argument of men against learned male authorities. So she's basically taking the, the academic argument that, that men give, knowing, you know, uh, you should know that during this time period, uh, women weren't allowed to get um, an education in any way. It was um, it was frowned upon, and it wasn't allowed. Um, so she had to build her argument on the argument of men, um, and so she builds. She looks at the the um, academic argument of men against um, the authorities, um, the male authorities. Then lines 198 through 508. The wife remembers how she exploited her first four husbands. So she tells you the tale of the first four husbands and how she exploited them um, for her own benefit. In lines 509 to 834, she describes her fifth marriage with Jankin. And um, this marriage is different because um, she actually loves him. Um, but he is, um, he is well versed in the tales of wicked wives. And this is a very common tradition during this time period. It's called the anti-feminist tradition, and um, it was basically a way of keeping women down. It was the idea of um, any woman who goes outside of the norm um, is thought of as a you know, wicked wife. Um, the thesis um, for this particular prologue is the, you know, the, the troubles of uh, marriage for women, How, you know, the downside of marriage for women during the Middle Ages, um, and the style is um, she's she's moving in this um, this in this prologue between an academic tone and a down to earth tone. She's using both, and that's important because um, she couldn't really own an academic tone um, if Chaucer is writing her correctly because she couldn't have gotten an education, an, a university education. In her tale, um, the first half of the poem is public, um, and the second half takes place while she's in bed. Um, the topics are what women what women want, the nature of true class or um, gentilis, um, what makes a good marriage, and what is beauty. And um, there's a structuring image in here that I'd like you to look up um, Midas's ears. So when you see that image, uh, make sure you look it up and see what it means. The primary sections are um, lines nine, 956 through 988. That's Midas's exoplum. 
um, lines one, 1,115 to 1,182. This is the Sermon on, of, on the Nature of True Class. And lines 1213 to 1122 is um, all about age and ugliness. So when you go through this, this is just meant to guide you as you're doing your active reading. Remember, you're going to need to circle things. You're going to need to ask questions while you're reading this. If, as you're re closely reading The Wife of Bath's Tale or The Wife of Bath's Prologue, um, come see me in my office or send me an email if you have questions. What I want you to do is to really understand this in a way that you can um, talk about it in our discussion forum. Speaking of which, um, our discussion forum this week is going to be on medieval sexuality and the legend of Arthur. Now this is something that's going to, we're going to look closely at the Wife of Bass prologue and tale um, with the intent to understand how this tale is a feminist Arthurian romance. This is something that we're going to come back to next week, so don't worry if you don't understand what that means, um, when we're reading Sir Gawain and the Green Knight and Morte de Arthur, which is um, all about the legend of Arthur. Arthur. So we're going to be talking about, you, you've probably heard of the legend of Arthur before, um, and it's the idea of the knight, uh, the knights of the round table, um, you know, going out to slay the dragon. Um, Arthur is, you know, the knight to save all knights, and um, Genevieve is his, um, is his, um, his lady. So we'll, we're going to be talking about that in much more detail, but what I want you to do is prepare for that by looking at Chaucer's idea of um, what, um, what it means to be a woman during this time. The main themes of The Wife of Bath's Tale are sexual ideology, economic independence, and mar martial powers. Her prologue deals with her stubborn refusal to let herself be exploited by a society where women have no education and few liberties under laws, and where rich old men acquire young girls as property. Um, after, you, after reading um, the prologue and the tale, answer the following questions using evidence from the text to support what you're saying. That means please support what you're saying with, um, by adding in quotations from the actual source text. Do you see the Wife of Bath as an early feminist heroine who is fighting against and perhaps triumphing over a patriarchal society that considers women fair game for disparagement and violence? Um, how does the wife manipulate argument and textual authority? Is she justified in manipulating text and argument in the way that she does? Does she reveal power struggles that are inevitable in marriage? How acute is the wife about why so few stories about good wives exist? All right, guys. Now, I know that much of this is, um, is difficult text, and you guys are doing a great job. I know last week was a challenging week because of the earthquake, and so many of you had to deal with so much, and I completely understand. I do really, really, really want you to keep up, though, so that we don't fall behind moving forward. So if you need help catching up, please come see me. This um, next week, we're going to be still in the Middle Ages, but we're going to be looking at the myth of Arthur. Um, like I said, we're going to be reading um, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, selections from it, and Mallory's um, Or to Arthur. Um, so we're going to be looking at, um, we're going to, we're actually going to, start thinking about the thematic, um, uh, the, the, the similar themes that run through Beowulf, um, some of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, and um, the Legend of Arthur um, uh, text that we're going to be reading next week, okay? So you're doing a great job. Um, don't forget to take the quizzes. Um, you can take them as many times as you want. There are two short quizzes this week about the Canterbury Tales. Use these when you miss them. Use them as a way to look back and see what you've forgotten um, from your reading. All right. I look forward to seeing you guys online.